it was very interesting because just as I was starting to read this book, I was going through a phase where I was thinking that my son was kind of, my son had this glass half empty view to life. Everything we ask him, even though he's had a really nice day, when we ask him whether he's had a good day, he'll say yes, but, and then he'll start pointing out all the bad things that had happened. And so reading this book was really interesting because I think towards the beginning, you were talking something about the power of perspective. Yes. And the different um, strategies that you could use. So that was very helpful and I'm trying to implement it. Uh, I've introduced the what went well. Excellent. Yeah. How's it going? Um, he's celebrating the fact that he's had a good day. There was a good moment. I'm calling it a win. Yes. I think the other thing to think about with boys in particular that we found in our research is that boys are socialized to be negative. Are they? Yes, in the way that, you know, real men aren't Pollyanna, real men, you know, it's almost a feminist, a feminine trait to be optimistic. So yeah. boys, particularly as they get into the tween years, they start to actually perform negativity because they feel like that's what real men do. And what happens is that what they perform, they feel and they become. So it does not serve these boys to be, you know, everything's a bit crap and, you know, all the yeah. time. It hurts them. Yes, I'm a very strong believer of what you say and what you believe you become. And, and so, yeah, that's why I'm trying to get this out of him at six years old, hopefully by the time he hits the twins. <laughs> Well, the, when he is a tween, then he will actually understand that he is choosing to make himself feel bad. And he just as easily can choose not to. So I, we had this situation with our daughter just this morning. So obviously she's not raised with the expectation of being negative and, and being male, but she was going to her school holiday program and she wanted to go. She'd been asking for days. And then this morning she decided she didn't want to go and she was crying on her way there. And she had to go because if we told her at that point that she could stay home, we would have been saying to her, you're right, you can't handle it. And that would have robbed her of her power perspective. So she had to go. And so we were supporting her. And so we said to her, you are choosing to feel this way because you are thinking about things that you don't like. But there are so many things about today that you do like because you are asking us to go. And so you have the power to choose to focus on what you do like and have a good day and feel happy. So that was our little pep talk before she walked through the door. And at nine, she could understand that, that she actually has the power to choose what sort of day she's going to have. It's funny because when I first read the, the headlines where you say the power perspective, I was thinking that, you know, you're trying to tell them that they are the strong muscle. Uh -huh. power. And then as I read, I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. You have the power to change your perspective. That's right. And we also have the power to decide for ourselves whether or not we're good enough. And yeah. so as a society, we are becoming more external in the way we judge ourselves. We defer to marks on tests, benchmarking, you know, even as babies, we're looking at external measures to see, you know, did our kid walk at the right age and not have a dummy and with how long were they breastfed for and when were they toilet trained? Like it's all these external things. And then we get to school and there is far more focus on test results than ever before. And then we get into, you know, the world of social media and its likes and its comments. And so we're becoming external, which by definition will make someone insecure because you cannot control how other people feel about you and judge you. So we have to raise our kids to live by their own standards and not by other people's. And so that's part of the power perspective as well. That's your superpower. You have the power to decide who you are and if you're good enough and don't give that power away to someone else. The other thing that I really enjoyed that like on a personal level that really was really helpful is so my son also has the tendency to go what if and it just catastrophizes everything and it just gets worse and worse and I like what you said about well flip it around what if it goes what if it goes well what if things are much better than you expect and I tried that with him last night and yeah it was 
it actually stopped him in the tracks. Uh-huh. And so yes. that was very helpful. Oh, that's good. So that's some um, called Kuwe's Law. And the idea is that when your imagination, so that's your little voice worrying about everything that's going wrong, that's your what if, is in conflict with what you want to happen, the imagination will win out every single time. So when we imagine the worst case scenario, when we do the what if I fall over, what if no one plays with me, what if I don't get a mark on my test, we're almost making that happen. And so you can hack Kuwe's law, like you said, by focusing on what you want to happen rather than on what you don't want to happen. And this is well established in life. So we know that elite athletes they're not sitting at before their race going, oh gosh, what if I fall in the pool? <laughs> you know, what if I, you know, trip over? What if I do that? They are visualizing what they want to happen, the perfect race. And we know that um, public speaking societies coach the speakers to visualize the perfect speech. I do that when I'm speaking, I visualize things going well. And so when your child is speaking on assembly and they're worried about what's going to happen, stop that there and say, Let's imagine everything going right. Talk me through it step by step. You get up from your seat and you walk to the stage. Tell me everything's going right. And you imagine that. And you do that the day before and then you do it in the morning. And that increases the chances of them actually doing what they want to happen rather than living out their fears. It's funny because I've never thought of when he goes into the what ifs, I just say, well, let's not think about that it's not going to happen. But I like the heck that, you know, well, let's think about what is, but let's think about the opposite, the positive side of what is. That's That's right. And it's not magic. So we're not talking about magical woo-woo manifesting or anything like that. We're just talking about focusing our mind. And we also know that when you focus on things that the good things that are going to happen or that you expect to happen, you work harder because boys aren't going to work hard for a test if they think they're going to fail. Like, what's the point of that? Whereas if they've thought about, well, uh, what if I do well? What if everything goes right? Then they're going to be more motivated to practice, to try. They're not going to psych themselves out when they're sitting there in front of the test. So it's not, um, yeah, magical thinking. It's actually um, hacking your brain. I I do a little bit of snowboarding. And one thing I realise is that when I'm snowboarding, going down the hill and I if I start going oh I'm gonna fall that's when I fall if I don't think about it I actually do well I actually stay upright and yeah so it's 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 very interesting how our brain can cause us to do yeah do what we think would happen and so that's something to think about parenting as well so when your boy's climbing a tree you don't say don't fall because what's he doing he has to imagine falling to don't fall you say hold on tight yes when he's walking with the plate you don't say don't drop the plate you say hold the plate steady yeah visualize and mention what you want to happen yeah so more about this book it's well it's called bringing up boys who like themselves I guess we'll we'll start with the beginning. Why? What have you noticed about boys that have made you write write this book? Okay, so to answer that question, we need to go all the way back to 2009. (laughs) And so 2009 was when my daughter, so I co-wrote the book um, with my husband, Dr. Christopher Scanlon. 2009 was when our daughter was born, um, Violet. And we, I remember bringing her home from hospital and feeling like most parents going, who let us do this? Like, we are so ill-equipped. Like, surely someone should have intervened and said, you are not qualified. And so we thought about what we wanted for Violet. And we are researchers and writers. So we decided that we would put some effort into actually working out what sort of parents we wanted to be. And my deep motivation was I wanted Violet to grow up liking herself more than I did when I was growing up. I had all the external markers that should have made me happy and confident and secure. But I grew up my whole life feeling insecure, like I was never good enough. And I knew many other women who felt the same. And I didn't want that for Violet. And I didn't know how to raise her so she wouldn't feel like that because this is passed down through the generations is insecurity. 
And so that was Chris and my project for ourselves. We wanted to work out what we needed to do to raise Violet to fully believe in herself, back herself and like herself. And then that turned into our book, Raising Girls Who Like Themselves, because our friends said, I don't care about the research, just tell me what I have to do. <laughs> and so that's what we did. We wanted to tell people what you could do to raise your daughter to like herself. And that book came out in 2001. On that day that it came out, we were at a cafe with some three friends. And Chris and I were quite excited about our book, but one of our friends started crying and she said, my boy doesn't like himself. And then we turned to another friend who also was a mother of a boy. And she said, mine doesn't either. And then our third friend, who was also a mother of a boy, we looked to her and said, what do you think? And, and she said, I don't want to say this out loud, but if I'm being really honest, I have to admit that my boy hasn't liked himself for a while. And after that day, the questions started coming in constantly on social media, on our webinars, when we were speaking at events, people would come up to us and say, what about boys? What can I do so that my boy will like himself too? And because we got so many questions from boy parents, and then we started hearing from mums who had read Raising Girls Who Liked Themselves and applied it to their sons with success. Some of the stories have been life-changing success for their boys. That's when we decided to research boys. And we didn't know what we were going to find when we started because we were the parents of girls. We now have, we have two daughters. And so we started from the same place as everybody else. The horror stories, the stats, you know, the, the scary statistics out about boys and their performance at school and their mental health and the increased race, rate of suicide. And so that was our starting point. And we read deeply. And because we are journalists, we can call up anyone in the world and they'll speak to us. And the good news, Melody, is that the more we researched, the more optimistic we actually became that we can raise boys to like themselves. Like it is possible to give our boys a strong enough foundation so that they can withstand the cyclones of life. Because as parents, we can't protect them. We can't even anticipate what our boys are going to face. We can give them the foundation so they can withstand it. And we can also give them the foundation so that they are strong enough to reach their potential as well and make the most of their opportunities. So this foundation that you're talking about, I guess you you boiled it down into this book where it's talking about the seven pillars of a boy who likes himself. How did you actually get to the point where you boiled it down to seven? Yeah, How it's really interesting because for girls, it's seven pillars as well. And we didn't set out and say they have to be, there has to be seven, you know, the biblical number or whatever. That's not how it worked at all. It was just creating frameworks and pattern matching. So there are definite similarities between a girl, what you need, the foundation for a girl to like herself and the foundation for a boy to like himself. But there are also differences because whether we like it or not, the moment your boy takes his first breath, he will be, the world will treat him differently from if he was a girl. And so our, because the problem is different, the solution needs to be different too. And just when we were looking at the research, it just fitted into seven things. If you can do these seven things, then you are giving your boy the very best foundation for him to thrive. So I might be putting you on the spot, but could you give me a very, very quick summary of what these seven things are? Certainly. Okay, so the first one which we've touched on, and that's the power perspective. And this is the idea that we cannot control all the things that are going to happen in our life, but we do have the power to control how we perceive those things and how we respond to those things. And so if we can teach our boys to think in a way that works for them rather than against them, then they will be able to thrive in life. And just a very quick example, you can edit this out if I'm going too long but a really quick example is two boys going off to school camp they're going to exactly the same place doing exactly the same things with the same people one boy will bound onto the bus and the other one will have not slept for a week anxiety clinging to his mum's leg crying very often the difference between those two boys responses is their perspective 
It's not their reality. So if we can build a power perspective, help them think in a more empowered way, then that can change their whole world. So that's pillar number one, the power perspective. Pillar number two is body confidence. So a poor body image used to be something that only girl parents had to worry about, but it's not the case anymore. The research is really clear in this. Um, body dysmorphia, eating disorders, and just a general dissatisfaction with how your body appears is becoming an increasing issue for boys. But the problem is, while we're now very much aware of body image problems for girls, we are, as a society, we are not there yet for boys. And just one small example is that we debate whether or not it's okay to give a girl a doll with an unrealistic body shape. Whether you do or not, we've ha we're having that conversation. But we don't think twice about giving a boy He-Man or Captain America or Batman and their body shape is just as unrealistic and just as unattainable and unhealthy, but we don't even think about it. Um, so that's body confidence. And the idea is that if your boy is going to get through his teen years with his self-esteem intact, you need to start building his body confidence now rather than just letting things fly under the radar because we don't expect this to happen with boys. Okay, the next one, let me see if I've got them in the right order. Sorry, I should be able to just reel them off in the right order. You'll get my out. Oh, okay, sorry, that was number three. <laughs> number two, which I skipped over, was strength of character. And this is a really important one because when we started researching our book, because we were not boy parents and we didn't have the anecdotes and we hadn't been gathering all the experiences, we asked 15,000 parents what their biggest concerns were in raising boys and what questions they wanted answers for, evidence-based answers for. And what came back were nine things. There were It was striking how similar the concerns were. But one thing that came back a lot was this concern that parents had to choose between raising a boy who was tough or weak. They felt that they needed to toughen their boy up because if they didn't, he would be weak and they, nobody wants their boy to be weak. No one wants their kid to be the one who slammed up against the locker or picked on. So, and this particularly for dads, dads really wanted to toughen their boy up because they've been in the schoolyard right and they know that how hard it is but the good news is that tough and weak is actually a false choice and what we found from our research was by toughening up your boy you you are actually making him brittle and that and so weakness is actually a consequence of tough and what we should be doing instead is trying to make our boys strong so let me tell you what I mean by that. So a tough boy, for example, never backs away from a fight. Now, if you are in a position where you can't back away from a fight, who has the power there? The other person, right? It's not a powerful position. You're being forced into a fight, which is scary and hurts. And, and also research shows that physical violence just escalates to more physical violence, right? So that's the tough thing to do. The strong thing to do is go, no, thank you. I'm walking away. I'm keeping that power for myself. Yeah. A tough person or a tough man, tough boy, has to dominate and control. The problem with that is that you're not always going to have someone to dominate and control. So how are you going to feel then? Right. So a strong boy, someone with strength of character, their well-being and their sense of self comes from within. They don't need to rely on dominating someone else to feel OK about themselves. A boy with strength of character can like himself all the time, not just when he's winning. A tough boy doesn't show his emotions. Right. But we know that boys who don't show their emotions do worse at school because if they can't handle their emotions, about something that happened in the playground, they are not learning in class. Boys who cannot deal with difficult feelings don't reach their potential, not because they're not good enough, it's because they can't handle the discomfort of feedback. Boys who can't handle their emotions don't have meaningful relationships because you need to be emotionally vulnerable. So strength of character is not, 
offloading your emotions on someone else or avoiding situations where you might feel them. Strength of character is having the strength to carry your own pain, taking responsibility for naming, handling and dealing with your own emotions. So that's strength of character. And essentially, it is building your boyfriend within rather than relying on external validation for him to feel okay about himself. Then we get body confidence, which I've just covered. And then number four is balance. Part of balance is the idea that if your boy is going to be emotionally healthy, if he's going to be physically healthy, if he's going to be able to regulate his emotions, concentrate in class, um, deal with difficult feelings, he has to be not tired right? He has to be not overscheduled and he has to be not stressed and pushed. And there is this idea that particularly for boys, that we have to push them and drag them through their education. And what that does is puts boys in a situation where they are not at their best. Like we know for us from ourselves, if we haven't had enough sleep for a couple of weeks, we're not regulating our emotions very well. We are not performing our best at work, but yet some boys are this tired and this stressed all the time. The other part of balance, which is really good news for parents, is we looked into screen time and computer games because what we found was that one of the reasons parents were overscheduling their boys with extracurricular activities and tutoring and not letting them play was a fear of screens. Mm -hmm. because our generation of parents have been told that screens are the worst thing and if your kid's on a screen you're a bad parent and all these awful things are going to happen. Now Chris and I are researchers so we looked at the actual research of screens and what it does to kids and the good news is that most of the headlines are exaggerated overdramatic and inflammatory, that if you actually look at what the research says about screen times, the research is not in yet. There is not clear evidence to show that screen time does harm to children's brains. So much so that the Pediatric Society, the Royal Pediatric Society in the UK, they don't give a recommendation for screen time for children because they say there isn't enough evidence to give a time, a time limit. So what they say, and this is very reasonable advice, is that allow screens into your boy's life in balance with everything else that's going on. So if your boy is playing outside enough, if he's hitting all his milestones, if he's happy, if he's functioning, then let him play on the screen, that's fine. Okay, you don't have to keep your kid off screens. In fact, there's some research to show that Children who are not interacting online have worse mental health than the ones who do. And the reason for that is that's our kid's playground. So you take your kid away from his playground, you're taking him away from his play and you're taking him away from his friends. So in our generation, we were kicked out on the street and told to play. If we kick our boy out onto the street, well, first of all, we might get a knock on the door from social services, but there aren't any kids there to play with. And this is particularly important for boys because we know when girls play and communicate, they can sit opposite each other, make eye contact and have a deep and meaningful conversation. That re Boys rarely do that. The way that boys actually connect and make friends is by doing something else, by playing a computer game together, for example. That is where they build their relationships. That is where they maintain their relationships. And those friendships are absolutely critical to mental health and well-being. So the research is in on that. And we do know for sure that your boy needs friendships. So, yes, the good news is don't feel guilty about your boy playing on screens. Of course, we need to make sure our kids are safe. But that's a parenting issue. It's not a screen issue. Hallelujah. Exactly. <laughs> I know. And there's also this is really great study that looks at play and how good play is for kids' brains. And what I mean by play is real play, where kids are in control, make decisions, are creative and it's child led. OK, so it's not a learning activity dressed up as play. Now, so this play is really important for children's brains. It's really important for them to discover their strengths and for their well-being. Play online like in games like Roblox and Minecraft, is just as good as play outside in the park for your child's brain development, social skills. So there's 
if your child is playing the right games where they are free to play real for real play, then it is actually really good for them. That's a lot of relief because, you know, every time it's like when he asks for the phone or the screen and you, I can just feel myself bristle and go, no, it's horrible. Exactly. There's, yeah. there's so much pressure on us, isn't it? But the thing is, this, when books first came out, parents were shamed for letting their kids read books because it would damage their brain. And now... It's a humble brag, isn't it, to say, oh, my kid's a reader, right? It's screens is just the next version of this. Every time a new technology comes out, we demonise it. And so something else that we hear a lot from parents is that when my boy's on screens, I can't get him off and he gets really angry. Therefore, screens are bad for my boy. So we hear that a lot. But what I would say is that it's not the screen that's the problem. It's the way that we interact with it. So for example, if your boy was playing a basketball game and you and he's on the court, he's just about to shoot a goal and you go, okay, basketball time's up the way we do with screen time, right? Okay, no more screen, get off. We do that to basketball. Okay, off you come. And we march on the court and we drag him off the court. How's he going to react? So not only is he going to be annoyed because he was in the middle of a game, he's going to be frustrated and embarrassed because he's let his team down. Often when boys are playing computer games and we yank them out of there, they are letting their friends down and their team down. It's the same thing, right? So we would never pull the kid off a basketball court because we as parents understand that and we value it. And that's the good thing to do because they're physical activity. <laughs> that's right. But to our boys, his online game is just as important to him. And the connections and his teammates are just as important to him in that game too. So if we respect that, then he's not going to get angry at us. So, for example, if we respect it, we say to him, okay, you're going to have to get off in 20 minutes. So work out the best time to end the game. So because some games, if he just gets off, he's lost all the work he's been doing for half an hour or whatever, right? So we just need to respect that play and give him some power to end it, not let his mates down, and then he can get off and he'll be less angry at you. <laughs> okay, so that's balance. The next one is mastery and independence. And this is the idea that real self-esteem comes from actually being able to do life. So as parents, our generation, when we were growing up, we would we grew up in the self-esteem movement, which told us that if you tell kids over and over again that they're awesome, then one day they'll believe it and then they'll do well in life. And we still have that as a legacy. You know, you, in, you, all you have to do is go to a park and you hear how many kids are so awesome, right? And we think that we're building our kids up, but those are word presence. You cannot give your kid self-esteem with word presence. Self-esteem comes from mastery and independence. And that means we have to give our boys the skills to do life. And I'm not talking about a cabinet full of trophies or awards it's about being able to look after yourself so and that's a particular issue for boys because girls tend to do more domestic work than boys so they can grow up and they don't know how to feed themselves they don't know how to wash their own clothes they don't know how to look after other people which is disempowering right so there's that basic level but it's also just taking responsibility for their own belongings taking responsibility for navigating space and also talking to people in authority. And I was talking to a mum just recently. So she said her boy was very shy and she couldn't get him to talk to people. And so I said that we need to encourage our boys to and our girls to talk for themselves wherever possible. And the research shows this, that kids who talk for themselves are, are, are encouraged to, they do better at school, they have better friendships, they do better socially, they do better in the workplace. Like they have to learn those skills. And a really easy way to do that is to do it in a restaurant or a cafe. Make your boy order for himself. It's very motivating because if you don't order, you don't get, right? And so this mom, she started doing this and she said that her boy now is so 
excited about ordering for himself. He will go into a cafe and order something even when they weren't buying anything. But she said the look of pride on his face is breathtaking and that is self-esteem that's that comes from mastery and independence and you cannot give that to a child mm -hmm. it comes from within by them being able to do life and the rule for mastery and independence is only do for your boy what he cannot do for himself and so within reason you know like sometimes you don't have half an hour in the morning for him to tie his own shoelaces but in general the more he can do for himself the more confident he will feel as a person the less anxiety he will have because one of the things about anxiety at its root cause is a feeling that you will not be able to cope with something that hasn't happened yet that's what anxiety is and the more proof that your boy can cope with life the less fear he's going to have about it and the less anxiety he's going to have and I guess look at it from a different point of view is that if we keep doing it for them, we're, we're never going to be there all the time to do something for them. So the faster they learn how to do it themselves, the easier it is for us if we're out of their lives. That's right. And that's our job. And I think it's really hard for parents of our generation because we feel, particularly mums, that our job is to make our children's life as wonderful and carefree and happy and joyful as possible, right? We feel like that's what good being a good mum is. But that's not actually our job. Our job is to raise functioning adults who don't need us. And some and the, the reality is that the pathway to success, the pathway to mastery is paved with struggle. And if we deny our children the opportunity to struggle, we are denying them the opportunity to succeed. Just one more thing that is particular to boys in mastery and independence is a real fear of failure and I mean girls can have it too but it's particular for boys because they don't have many role models of men admitting failure so we know that men apologize far less than women and part of us of masculinity is real men don't make mistakes real men are you know perfect get it right all the time so there's no role model of I stuffed up, I learned from my mistakes and I got back up and did it again and I was okay. And so boys grow up fearing failure. And a lot of parents, what they, what they think they're seeing in their boy is laziness. We heard that so many times in our research, my boy's so lazy, he won't do anything, he won't try anything. One of the reasons boys appear to be lazy is they're scared of failure. They've opted out. So it's much safer emotionally for them to do nothing for the, than them to try and fail. So you don't try, then you won't fail. Exactly. That's right. So parents of boys in particular need to be very intentional in normalizing failure. They need to help their boys realize that when you fail, that's a stepping stone on the pathway to success. And so we do that through stories, particularly with dads if, and other male role models. If they can talk about how they failed and how they learned from that and got back up and succeeded, then that helps boys. But another way to do that is to focus on the process rather than the outcome. So, for example, in our family, we don't ever ask about test results. Just don't ask about it. We only talk about the process of learning. Did you try something hard? Did you not know something and then ask the teacher? When you got that wrong, did you go and work out what you could do better next time? So by focusing on the process, failure is part of that process. And so that normalizes it, but it also um, gives your boy something that he can control. He can control that process. He can control working hard. He can control learning from failure. He can control getting back up again. He, we can't always control the outcome but we can control that process. So that's empowering as well. Okay, so the next one, sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I was like, oh, yep. And then number six. <laughs> okay, so number six is strong relationships. And this is a really interesting one because when we first started talking to boy parents who also had daughters, they would say, oh, friendships is something I don't have to worry about with my boy. Girls, friendships, drama, drama, drama. She comes home in tears. We have to workshop everything that happened. But boys, they just get on with it. 
that is a common belief. It's also wrong, okay? Friendship is a skill. It's a set of skills that our kids need to learn. And sure, some kids will learn it easily, just like other skills, but a lot of kids don't. They need practice. And the reason we know that boys struggle with friendship skills is that by the time boys get to teenage years, their friendships start to decline and they continue to decline into adulthood. And we have an epidemic of lonely men. And we know that loneliness is as deadly as cancer. We know that it is a factor in poor mental health and in suicide. So men and boys need friends, but they also need our help in learning how to make friends how to keep friends. That's a really big one for boys. You know, they might have friends when they're kicking the footy around when they're eight, but they don't know how to keep them when they're 16. They also need help in learning how to deal with conflict in productive ways. And this came up a lot in our research too. Parents didn't want to tell their kid to punch, but they didn't know what else to say. So their kid was being picked on day after day, or they were again worried that their kid was weak. So they told their boy to punch back. So this is not a good idea for a couple of reasons. Firstly, um, it doesn't work. So the research shows that if kids punch back, they get they just make themselves more of a target. So it doesn't end the bullying. It escalates the bullying. The other thing is that we should not be encouraging our boys to do something that could ruin their lives when they're men. So if we have taught them at 8, 9, 10, to punch back, what's going to stop them from doing that at 18, 19, 20? When they're in a bar, having drunk alcohol, in some kind of conflict, you do not want them to take your advice in that moment, punch back, potentially king hit, and spend the best years of their life in prison, right? We also don't want them to be, you know, punching their children, their partners, their bosses, or any resolving any conflict with violence. So we should not be encouraging our boys to do it. And the good thing, the thing with it, situations like this, especially for kids, is that, you know, they get bullied. And if you retaliate, you're generally the one that gets caught by the teacher for doing something bad. That's right. It happens for sure. And so just one really powerful strategy, and we have seen this work over and over again, is called a quick come back. And this is the advice of friendship skills expert Dana Kerford. And the research is really clear on this. Kids who have a quick comeback are bullied less often and less severely. And what it is, it's a statement that you choose and practice ahead of time. You practice it at home. So in the heat of the moment, you're able to say it and you're able to say it with authority. So it's a statement. It lets the other kid know that you saw what they did and it's not okay. But it's also not going to get you in trouble if a teacher hears it. So it's not swearing. It's not mean. So it's something like, that's not okay, or seriously, or that's the best you've got, or um, what's another one? That was mean, something like that, or stop it. I don't like it. So the kid delivers their quick comeback with authority and then walks away. And just a quick example, we had this boy who every time he lined up in class he got elbowed in the guts by the kid in front of him and you line up for class three times a day right so three times a day he was getting elbowed in the guts and he would come home and he'd be really upset and they didn't know what to do about it. they'd spoken to the teacher but then the kid was just sneakier when he did it so the mum practiced the quick comeback with the boy and he did it once and the boy delivered his quick comeback and it stopped and then the next time they lined up, so that was in the, in the morning, at morning tea, the kid did it again and the boy delivered his quick comeback. And then by lunchtime, he, had, he didn't do it anymore. And also the kid who was being elbowed in the gut said that the, the other boy was now being really nice to him. So what it is, is it's standing up for yourself with dignity and respect and letting the other kid know, I saw what you did. I'm not okay with it. And that very often is enough to cut bullying off at its knees. And it's also a far more effective and safer strategy than encouraging boys to punch. Okay, so that's strong relationships. And so 
the idea is we need to help our boys with our friendships, with their friendships. And the research shows that boys value friendships just as much as girls do. But the reason they don't talk about them to you is because they have been a boy long enough to know that boys don't, right? So even if you're open in communication in your house, the world around them tells them boys don't talk about this. So we need to be really intentional in encouraging our boys to talk about their friendships, talk about their feelings at home. Okay, pillar number seven, which is my favorite pillar, is a boy who likes himself is himself. And this is about authenticity, the idea that if your boy is going to actually like himself, he has to be allowed to grow into the best version of the person that he chooses to be, not the version that you choose for him or someone else. And so often as parents, we get this around the wrong way. We think that our boy is going to like himself if we sculpt him into a certain way and make him really successful, and then he'll like himself. That's not how it works. He has to be himself. And our job as parents is to provide the environment and the support to help him bloom in his own way and in his own time. Now, this is also an issue for girls, but it's particular, particularly difficult for boys because for many, many years, Many women, aunts, mums, teachers, politicians, we have been fighting for girls' rights to be anything that they want to be. Right? We've got so many programs about that, and we're far more open as a society to allow girls to pick their own path. But for boys, there's still only one way to be a boy, and the penalty for not being a boy is really high. So if your boy is outside that definition of, what a, a, of a traditional boy, the world can be really hard for him. But instead of trying to chisel away and make him that, we need to support him with strategies like the quick comeback, like unconditional love, so he knows that he is loved and supported in at home, so then he has the confidence to go out in the world and be the person that he wants to be. And a part of that is focusing on your boy's strengths rather than his weaknesses. So... It's the idea of helping your boy build his identity on what he can do rather than what he can't. So well-meaning parents think that they can make their boy successful and like themselves if they correct all their weaknesses, that they focus on he's not good at maths, so we need to focus more on his maths and he can't do this and he can't do that. That's all well-meaning, but that's not the strategy to raise a boy who likes himself. So if you want to correct your boy's weaknesses, the best thing you can do is to focus more on his strengths. And I'll give you an example. Imagine two boys. They both struggle with maths. And one has a parent who's constantly focused on him not being good at maths. Now, this kid's whole identity is I'm Johnny and I suck at maths. And so he doesn't want to practice maths because every time he practices, it's just a reminder that he's a loser, right? It's a really unpleasant experience. And then you get a boy who's also struggling at maths, but his parents focus on his strengths. You know, I'm Henry and I'm really good at computers and I can do great backflips on the trampoline, but I need extra help with maths. And so when he views himself like that, he's, he's more than willing to get extra help with maths because it doesn't define his worth. And in time, Henry is going to get better at maths because he's going to be more open to learning. And he's also going to grow up liking himself because he's focused on what he can do rather than on what he can't. Which comes back to the power perspective again. <laughs> That's right. So we say with the power perspective, every single problem that your boy is ever going to face can be solved or minimized by the power perspective. It affects everything in life. That's awesome. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much for basically going through the entire <laughs> Thank you. It's really, it's really helpful. But there's, there's just so much more in here as well. So much more tips. And thank you for doing for the, all the research and telling us this is what the research says. Every, every single strategy in that book is evidence-based, but it's also doable because that was our focus as well. Because a lot of parenting books we found in the early years, we'd read them and we'd just feel guilty because we couldn't do all the things that real parents, good parents are supposed to do. But the good news is, is that it's small everyday tweaks that win. We get to shape our boys first. We're the 
most influential voice, we're the first teachers, and with everyday tweaks, we can give them the foundation that they need. And it's really awesome because, you know, you read through all the information and you think, oh, how am I going to remember all of it? But at the end of every chapter, you've got that TLDR version. That's where you right. You look at the different dot points and go, oh, yes, I, re I remember that now. That's right. There's very, very basic strategies that you can just apply. So go to the cheat sheet and then just implement them in your family. 